Epilogue Sterling and Jake had returned to New York. They both made as many calls as they could to try find anything that might help Michael's situation with little success. Sterling was surprised to hear from Drew, asking her to attend a meeting with the Ramsley family. Jake received a similar call directly afterward from his brother Dylan. Perhaps they found something, Jake said hopefully. I hope so. Sterling did not have much faith. Her sources had been surprisingly empty. They canceled their plans for dinner and arrived at Max's condo in time for the meeting. Max greeted them cordially at the door, unsurprised that they had arrived together. In fact, he looked inordinately pleased. Ellen Paget have the kids at Noah's place. Kelly is currently taking care of Anne and the babies. Max invited them in. The rest of us are trying to get an update on what everyone has found out at the moment. Noah had already taken a seat, talking to Dylan and Everett. Jake recognized Drew Colburn and Bethany Searson, but there was another man with them. Jake greeted his brothers, introducing Sterling. Everett and Dylan were surprised, but kept their opinions to themselves, maintaining a polite demeanor towards her. "'You're the tabloid reporter who splashed my mother's personal business all over the papers,' the stranger said in disgust. "'Who asked you to come?' "'I did.' Drew spoke up as he helped Bethany take off her coat. Everyone, this is my brother Molson. I'm sorry about that. Sterling decided an apology was the best way to smooth things over, since she was trying to help the family. You should be. Molson looked at Sterling like she was a bug he wanted to step on. He pressed a finger to his temple. Margot ain't all there. I didn't know, Sterling stated softly. It was going to take a long time for her to gain anyone's trust in the Ramsley family after her previous career. She gave Jake's hand a warning squeeze to let her handle this when he took her hand in his. His brother Everett raised an eyebrow at the contact. I apologize. That is enough, Jake warned Molson. What, you all cozy with her after all the trash she wrote about you in her paper? Molson challenged Jake with a touch of disbelief. We talked and we worked it out. Jake said clearly in a tone of voice that brooked no argument. Leave her alone, Molson. Drew remonstrated his brother as he seated Bethany. We need all the help we can get to prove Michael's innocence and David's guilt. Sterling is here to help. She won't be putting any of this in the papers. Proof? Molson laughed bitterly. I got proof. I recorded the man himself bragging about how he put Michael in jail. You got Bethany remembering Pop cleaning drugs off the floor of a boat with her daddy. He tried to kill her because he's a sociopath. Then there's the paper trail from all that drug money he run through his own company. Don't all this count for something? Nowhere on the recording does David identify himself, Drew calmly explained. This makes the origin of the voice dubious, and you are not exactly a character witness material, Molson. While we could prove that Ted had a hand in attempting to kill Bethany, we couldn't pin anything on David, especially now that the pharmacy tech who filled the prescriptions has turned up dead. Bethany's repressive memories are admissible to court, but won't hold up under questioning. Any jury will discount them. Just because money has been laundered through the company does not mean that David did it. The finger could be pointed at a number of individuals, including Michael. That's bull, Molson exploded, pacing the room. I didn't say I agreed with it, Drew growled back. I'm just saying what the FBI has said to discount everything. Look, I don't like this any more than you do. If we were handling the case, I would bring all this up and we might be able to charge David. Individually, it's inconclusive. Together, it's all very damaging. However, when I spoke to Agent Law, he said none of it was pertinent to their case. Unless we can get something to stick, Law won't look at it. What we need is solid proof, Everett inserted into the conversation. Short of a full confession, I don't see how that's going to happen. Drew rubbed his face, exhausted. He had been putting in extra hours trying to come up with any sort of solution, while Agent Law did his best to blow Drew off. We all know David is smug and conceited, but I don't think he's going to let me record him boasting about his victory. I have a different angle. Sterling hesitated to bring it up. I don't have proof yet. It's only a theory. What is it? Max asked hopefully. A theory. Molson was sarcastic. A lot of good that will do. Let her speak, Jake gave Molson a hard look, putting a hand on Sterling's shoulder. I have someone looking into the FBI agent Law's financials. 
What? Max was surprised. You think Dad was bribing him? Is that even legal, to looking into someone's financials? Bethany asked. Can you do that? No, it's not legal, Drew answered with a frown, which means anything you find is inadmissible in court. True, Sterling conceded. However, if law is accepting bribes from David, we would be able to find out. If this is the case, then perhaps some reason could be manufactured to look into the money trail and get them caught. That is crazy. Noah leaned back in his chair, shaking his head. An FBI agent accepting bribes. It would mean the end of his career. It would mean prison time, Drew commented coldly. It was no secret that he didn't like law. The reality is, law is not likely to jeopardize himself for money. It's just a theory, offered Sterling. One, that it does not hurt to confirm or rule out. Jake supported her. If law is accepting bribes and we can prove it, what happens to the case? The whole case would be suspect and have to be reevaluated. Drew shrugged. It would implicate David and he could be arrested again as any deal the FBI made with him might be void if law had a hand in it. However, if there's still evidence against Michael, that doesn't go away until someone confesses that they planted it. It's a highly unlikely scenario. Not only that, we must have just cause to go before a judge to get evidence legally to implicate that law is accepting bribes or planting evidence. If we can't find just cause, the evidence is inadmissible and useless. Then it doesn't help Michael at all, Noah asked grimly. No, it doesn't, Drew said quietly. He spotted Molson leaving. Where are you going? Molson paused at the door. To do something. I got contacts, too. I'm going to start asking some hard questions and see what happens. Drew scowled. You really think your gangbanger friends are going to help? Won't know until I ask, Molson stated as he pulled the door shut behind him. Your brother is a bit of a hothead, commented Noah. Says my hothead of a brother, Max stated calmly. Look, if he can find out anything that helps, more power to him. Is there anything else that we have that can help Michael? I don't think there is. Keep trying. Perhaps something will come to light that we can use. Drew shrugged, not feeling hopeful. I apologize for Molson. He feels responsible. How can he feel responsible? asked Everett with a frown. David called him. He said that Molson had given the idea from a conversation the two had previously had to frame Michael and testify against him for immunity, explained Drew. David basically thanked Molson. None of this was Molson's intention. Now he feels responsible. The room was quiet while they assimilated this statement. What about the evidence that I brought to you earlier? Sterling quietly asked Drew. The department has decided to look into it, responded Drew. The problem is how the evidence was obtained. There is no way to prove it was or wasn't tampered with. Plus, it never showed who stole the drug. If we can obtain the same evidence and be able to prove who took the drug, we may be able to press charges. If we can't prove it, we have nothing. Then what can we do? questioned Dylan. Pool your resources to get Michael the best legal team that money can buy, a grim Drew suggested. He's going to need it. He could be spending the rest of his life in prison. If you enjoyed Stranded with the Billionaire, you might enjoy book seven of the Ramsley Brothers series, Unlikely Hero. Molson Colburn has always grown up with people looking down at him. He's made life choices that his family doesn't approve of, but he never let that bother him before, preferring to weather it all with a fine sense of sarcastic humor. Now he's serious about helping his half-brother Michael after he feels responsible for Michael's imprisonment. Holly Ershman has always done things by the book. She doesn't have so much as a parking ticket to her name. When a client of hers has their life threatened, she vows to get to the bottom of what happened. It's an unlikely pairing that neither of them wanted or expected. Yet once they put their heads together to help the Ramsley family, they find they work well as a team in more ways than one. We also met Katie Sutton and Jackson Davis in this book. Find their story in Kissing Katie. Jackson Davis is in a panic. Seven years ago, he sent a manuscript to an editor as a joke. Now he is becoming a famous romance writer under the pen name J.D. Emerson, and his editor wants him to go on a tour, 
including an interview on a daytime talk show. The problem? He let everyone think he is a woman writer. Katie Sutton is just not making it in life. Her car is an oil-gulping rust bucket. Her hours are being reduced at the daycare center where she works, plus her rent has gone up. She had always had a crush on Jackson, her friend Trent's older brother, but he sees her as he always has, Trent's buddy. Katie might just be the perfect answer to his problems if Jackson can get her to accept a position to pose as his pen name and do the tour for him. She could be the face of his muse. From mishaps, writer's block, and stage fright, Jackson and Katie are spending a lot of time together. For the first time, Jackson is really looking at Katie. What he sees makes him think of taking the romance off the paper and into reality. You can find it on Amazon. Happy listening.